welcome to episode 16. We're starting some new material today in math, uh, in math 1050, college algebra. I'm Dennis Allison in the math department here at Utah Valley State College. And uh, we're starting the new, a new chapter on exponential functions and logarithms. Uh, today we'll be talking about exponential functions and next time in episode 17, we'll look at logarithms. Let's go to our list of objectives for today. Uh, first of all, I'd like to review some fundamental properties of exponents that I think you're probably familiar with, but we just want to mention just before we get this started. Then we're going to look at some new fundamental graphs. These are fundamental graphs of exponential functions. We'll be making transformations of these exponential graphs. And then we'll look at one special exponential function called the so-called natural exponential function. Okay, uh, let's go to our list of review uh, properties. Okay, I'm wondering uh, if we all remember these properties of, ex of exponents uh, that we've covered in elementary and intermediate algebra before we look at exponential functions uh, in this section. Uh, who can tell me what is the product a to the m times a to the n? a to the m plus n. a to the m plus n, right. So when you're multiplying like bases, you add the exponents. What about uh, a to the m over a to the n? a to the m minus n. A to the m minus n. By the way, we have a qualifier over here that uh, uh, a can't be zero. Why is that? Because you can't divide by zero. Yeah, because you see a to any power would be zero, and you can't divide by zero. So we, of course, have to make that one stipulation. What about a to the m quantity raised to the n power? What would that be? a to the m times n. a to the m n power. Yeah, m times n. Exactly. Very good. Um, Finally, also, also, what is a to the zero power? One. A to the zero power is one whenever a is not zero. A to the zero power is one. What is zero to the zero power? Just to ask you offhand. One. No, actually it's not defined. Zero to the zero power has no meaning. Kind of like uh, you can't divide by zero, you can't raise zero to the zero power. Uh, you know, the reason for this rule, a to the zero power being one, is basically an extension of this very first rule. You see, if I were multiplying, over here on the side, if I were multiplying a to the third power times a to the zero, if I were using this first rule, I would add the exponents, and I would get a to the three plus zero is three. So what must a to the zero be? Because a cubed times this is a cubed. That must be what? One. That must be one. So that's why we, we just define it to be one, so that I can continue to use that rule. Then finally, our last, uh, our last uh, expression is a to the negative n. And uh, what is another way of expressing a to the negative n power? One over a to the n. One over a to the n, exactly. And the reason for that, let me just put that in the same space. You see, th these are merely definitions that we've been given, that we, that we give in mathematics. If you multiply a to the third times a to the negative three, if I use this very first rule up here, I should add exponents and I would get a to the three plus negative three is zero, which we said is one. So that means a to the negative three must be the reciprocal of a cubed. So we define this to be one over a to the third. So in general, a to the negative n is one over a to the n power. Okay, those are some of the fundamental properties of exponents <coughs> that we have seen in the past, and we'll be using those um, in this episode. Okay, uh, let's now look at how we find exponential values on a calculator. And let me bring my calculator in and set it up on the green screen. Um, if we could focus in, we could zoom in on this calculator right here. Uh, not everyone at home, maybe not all of you, or maybe perhaps uh, comfortable with taking exponential values on a calculator, so I want to show you how I can do that right here. Suppose I want to take uh, 3 squared. So if I turn my calculator on, I'll t enter 3. And then I have this button over here with sort of a, sort of a little, uh, let me move that up so you can see it. It has this little uh, carrot shape, this little, this little inverted V shape. That's the exponential key. And if I push that, what it says is the next number I enter is the exponent. So that, this now says 3 squared, 3 to the second power. And if I press Enter, then I get 9, 9. Let's do that one more time. Suppose I enter uh, 12, and I want to raise it to the third power. So I'll raise it to the third power, and I get 1728. 
Now, not, not every calculator has this symbol for their exponential key. Uh, and if we go to the next graphic, I'll show you what other calculators sometimes have. Let's go to the next graphic. Uh, here we go. Okay, so uh, you see in these two examples, we have three raised to the second power, and then when I press enter, that's the equal sign, then I got a nine. But on some calculators, you might uh, have a key that says y to the x power, and on this, then on that bottom line, we have one, uh, 125 raised to the power of, and then I put one third in parentheses. Parentheses, one divided by three, so that's 125 to the one-third power equals, and a one-third power is a cube root. So the cube root of 125 is five. And so you, you can see what the, what the, more, uh, what the more typical uh, expression for that relationship is on the right-hand side. The cube root of 125 is five. So you'll be using, uh, in this episode, either that, uh, that little inverted V key for exponents or Y to the X, and I think there may be some calculators that have x to the y, but um, uh, any, any of those should be able to give you an exponent. Okay, now uh, let's go to um, our fundamental exponential functions. And let's, to do that, let's go to the next graphic. Uh, the, a, a function such as f of x equals two raised to the x power with a variable in the exponent uh, is called an exponential function. And uh, here we're asked to sketch the graph of the exponential function f of x equals two to the x. Okay, let's go to the green screen and see how we would graph this. f of x equals two raised to the x power. Now you notice this time I have a constant in the base and I have a variable in the exponent. So that's why we call this an exponential function. Um, and I've never graphed this before. So as we've seen in the past, I'm gonna make a table, plot points, but of course that always gets to be rather long and tedious. I'm gonna look for target points and find a quicker way to graph this. So let's set up our table over here on the side and um, we'll label our columns x and two to the x. Now suppose we substitute in zero, one, two, three, or four. Um, the function values would be two to the zero, which is one, as we just saw. What's uh, two to the first power? Two. Is two, yeah, two to the first power is just two. Uh, what would be the function value for two? Two to the second power is? Four. Four, mm -hmm. And two to the third power is eight. And two to the fourth power, two to the fourth power is what? Sixteen. Sixteen. 16. Now, you notice what's happening is every time x increases by one, zero, one, two, three, four, my function values double. One, two, four, eight, 16. So I bet the next value would be 32 if I were to substitute in a five. So the values on the right are said to be increasing exponentially because they're doubling. The values on the left, the x values, are increasing linearly because they're increasing by one every time. Now, what if I substituted in negative numbers like negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four, et cetera? Well, if I substitute in negative one, I get two to the negative one power, which is uh, what, Matt? Wouldn't that be uh, one half? One half, you remember that was the last property on our list. Two to a negative power means one over two to the first power, and that's one half. If I substitute in negative two, two to the negative two power, that's one over two to the second power, which is one fourth. What's two to the negative three power? One eighth. One eighth. And what's two to the negative four power? One sixteenth. One sixteenth. Now, these numbers are decreasing linearly, negative one, negative two, negative three, negative four. And these numbers are decreasing exponentially because because we're going down, uh, these numbers are being cut in half. To, uh, one half, one fourth, one eighth, one sixteenth. Okay, now we have a lot of points there. Let's plot some, if not all of those, and see what our graph looks like. Let's label it out to four there, negative four here. Okay, that's about six right there. I'll go down a bit negative. This is the y-axis, of course. 
So I'm going to be plotting some ordered pairs. Uh, my first ordered pair would be 0, 1. And if I plot 0, 1, I get a point right here. <coughs> if I plot the point 1, 2, 1, 2, that would be right here. Uh, and then the next point I'd plot would be 2, what? 2, 4, right, 2, 4, right there. And then 3, 8. Well, 8 would be, let's say, about there. And 4, 16, 5, 32, those are so big, that they just go off the graph. So I, I think we can see that as the x's get bigger, this graph turns up very dramatically. And if I go to my negative values at negative 1, I would go up to uh, 1 half. 1 half right there. I could probably move that up just a shade. And then at negative 2, 1 fourth. So it's only half as, half as tall. And at negative 3, it's 1 eighth, only half as high as it was there. And at negative 4, it's 1 sixteenth. And at this point, it's so close, we really probably can't see the distinction between the point and the x-axis. So it looks to me like our graph looks like this. And this is a typical exponential function, the, the graph of a typical exponential function. Let me just write this over here. The graph of an exponential function. Um, this function has an asymptote. You remember in a couple episodes back, we were talking about rational functions with vertical and horizontal asymptotes. This function has an asymptote. What type of asymptote does it have? Horizontal. It has a horizontal asymptote, the x-axis. The x-axis is a horizontal asymptote. However, it does not have a vertical asymptote. Uh, the reason is, even though this graph is climbing, there's no imaginary wall, no imaginary vertical line that it approaches but never reaches. This function just keeps spreading out to the right and getting higher and higher and higher. For example, if you were to go over to uh, 10, which is beyond my graph, 2 to the 10th power would be over 1,000. You could check it on your calculator. It's 1,024. So at 10, it'll be at 1,000. Uh, and if you go beyond that, if you go further to the right, it'll be a million, and then a billion, and so forth. But there's, there's never a point where it approaches a vertical line uh, and can't cross it. Now, of course, in the future, I'll be graphing more uh, exponential functions, and I want to look for a shortcut so I don't have to make a table every time. So let's pick out some points here to be our target points. If we go back to this graph, the points I'm going to choose are the points 0, 1, and the point 1, 2, and the point negative 1, 1 half. Let me just list those over here. There's the point uh, uh, 0, 1, 1, 2, and negative 1, 1 half. Now, you notice it doesn't really matter what the base is, uh, say if the base is 3 or 5 or 7. When I raise it to the 0 power, I always get a 1. So I always go, go through the point 0, 1, irregardless of whatever the base is. But if I go over one unit, then the distance that I go up is whatever the base number is. So if I go over one, I get two to the first, or two. So whatever that base number is at one, I go up the base. If that had been three to the x, I would look, I'd locate the point one, three. And if I go to the left one, to negative one, can anyone tell me another way of explaining why that's one half? Stephen. One over the base? It's one over the base, yes. Because whatever the base is, you have the base raised to the negative one power, so you get the reciprocal of the base. OK, now, with that shortcut, we can start, start sketching these very quickly. Let's take a new exponential function. Uh, suppose I want to graph the function 5 to the x power. <coughs> so f of x equals 5 to the x power. We don't want to make that table because that's much too tedious to, to have to list every time. Let's take some shortcuts like we've been doing all through the course. Um, I'm going to plot only three points. Uh, first of all, at 0, I go up 1. 
Now the reason for that is if I substitute in 0 for x, 5 to the 0 is 1. And if I substitute in a 1, I go up 5. There's 5 right there. Because 5 to the first power is 5. And if I substitute in a negative 1, I go up 1 fifth. It's hard to locate that exactly, but we'll say that's 1 fifth. And now I know the general shape is that I have a, uh, I have a horizontal asymptote for the negative, what, negative x axis. And the graph turns, and it goes up very abruptly. As a matter of fact, the larger the base, the faster this, this curve turns up. And this is the graph of the exponential function 5 to the x. You know, while, while, we're, while we have this written on the screen, let me just mention that in later courses in business and physics and engineering and in mathematics, you'll sometimes see this function written this way. f of x equals exp sub 5 of x. This means the same thing as 5 to the x. And you might say, well, why would anybody want to write it that way when 5 to the x is so much more compact? Well, you see, this is a function of x. And so if we want to give a name to the function, this does not identify x as a function of x. It just places the x up in the exponent. So the name of the function is called the exp function. That means the exponential function. And if you put a little 5 there, that means it's the function 5 to the x power. Uh, I'm not going to use this on exams, but I just want to mention this to you so that if in a later course you see a function called exp, you'll know that this is, this is just the, a more familiar version of an exponential function. Let's take another, another function. <clears throat> Suppose I wanted to graph the function uh, capital G of x equals 10 to the x power, equals 10 to the x power. Uh, can anyone tell me three points to plot? Uh, three points to plot. Let's see, two, four, six, eight, ten is one unit higher than that. Uh, three, three points to plot so that I can draw this graph. X equals one. Uh, X equal, now we need an ordered pair. Oh, so it'd be um, one, ten. Okay, 1, 10. If you go over 1, you go up the base. So 1, 10, yep. 0, 1. Uh, 0, 1 right here. That's the point, 0, 1. And negative 1 and 1 tenth. And negative 1, 1 tenth. Now, gee whiz, we can hardly squeeze that in there. But that's supposed to be the point 0 and 1 tenth. Or if you prefer 0, 0 0.1 in decimal form. So this tells me that the graph is going to turn very dramatically up. At, whoops, we missed the point there, but uh, you get the idea. It goes through that point, and over here, it levels off very, very quickly so that it's almost indistinguishable from the x-axis. For example, at negative 2, how high is the graph at negative 2? 1 one hundredth. It's 1 one hundredth. It's 10 to the negative 2 power, or 1 over 100. And at negative 3, it's 1 one thousandth. So you see, this thing collapses very quickly, and it goes up very dramatically. Uh, you know what this reminds me of is the graphs of the higher order polynomials, like x squared is a parabola, x cubed was flatter in the middle, and it turns up more dramatically. x to the fourth is even flatter in the middle, turns up even more dramatically. So the same thing happens with the exponential functions when you increase the base rather than when you increase the exponent. Uh, another way of expressing this function, I'll just mention in passing, is to say this is exp sub 10 of x, if you should ever see that written in another, in another book. <clears throat> um, OK, let's look at another example of exponential functions. But I'm going to pick my base a little differently from those first few examples. Suppose we have g of x equals 1 half to the x power. Now, you see what makes this different is I'm picking a fraction smaller than 1, a positive fraction smaller than 1 in my base. When I go to graph this, I'm going to follow the same rule for my target points. We said that at 0, we'd go up 1 unit. So there's the point zero, 1. We said that if we go over 1, we'd go up the base. The base is a half. And if I go back 1, I'll go up the reciprocal of the base. And what's the reciprocal of 1 half? 2. 2. So you see, this time, I have a graph that's coming down. It's decreasing. 
and approaching the positive x-axis as a horizontal asymptote. So I can summarize the differences between this graph and the previous graphs this way. If the base is a positive number but smaller than 1, you get a decreasing function. And if the base is, uh, is a number bigger than 1, you get an increasing function. We saw 2 to the x, 5 to the x, 10 to the x. Those were all increasing from left to right. But if you put in a base smaller than 1, it forces this point to be lower, and the reciprocal is higher, and this becomes a decreasing function. Now, you know, I, I think a reasonable question is, why would anyone want to study exponential functions? And there are many applications for these, and some of these, will, some of these applications we'll study in this course. Uh, for example, population growth, um, compound interest in banking accounts gr can grow exponentially. On the other hand, functions that are decreasing, like the one I've, I've graphed right here, uh, would be radioactive decay. If you have a radioactive substance with a certain half-life, it, it has less and less radioactive material in it over time. So this would represent the graph of the amount of radioactive material in that. If that's a little confusing to you, I'd say hang on. In a later episode, we'll be talking about some of these very applications. And you can see how this is applied to banking, to business, to chemistry, and to physics. Susan. If that were a negative one-half, would the graph be flipped over the y-axis? Well, you know, we'll, we'll only consider situations where the base is a positive number. Oh, you mean a negative in front? Yeah. Oh, okay. Uh, if you put a negative in front, that would flip the graph over. Over the y-axis or the x-axis? Uh, it would flip it over the x-axis. Okay. It would be inverted, and it would be coming up from underneath. Uh, I thought Susan was going to ask, what happens if you put a negative number inside for the base, like a negative one-half quantity to the x-power? We won't be considering those functions because those are sort of in intermittently defined. Uh, a negative one-half power raised to a one-half power, that would mean a square root of a negative a half. We, get, we can get imaginary numbers in that case. So I think it's best to just leave those alone. Um, oh, Stephen. What if we had a variable in both the base and the exponent? Oh, my goodness. OK, well, now you're, you're getting to some interesting situations there. Uh, that's another situation we don't cover in this course. But uh, I suppose it's possible you could have a function like f of x equals x to the x power. Uh, let's just see. If you had x to the x power, what would be f of 2? 4. It would be 2 to the second power, 4. What would be f of 3? 27? It'd be 3 to the third power. See, you'd be plugging an x both in the base and in the exponent. 3 to the third power would be, uh, would be 27. Uh, although that's not what we will call an exponential function in this course, because we want a constant in the base, I would suggest you try graphing that on your graphing calculator. And if you take a course in calculus, I bet you will see that function come up along the way. Uh, let's go to the next graphic. And uh, here are some facts that kind of summarize what we said about exponential functions. <clears throat> First of all, the graph of f of x equals a to the x power, if a is bigger than 1, will curve up on the right and approaches the x-axis on the left, the x-axis being a horizontal asymptote. Uh, number two, the graph of f of x equals a to the x, if a is bigger than 0 but less than 1, it curves up on the left and approaches the x-axis on the right. And finally, one thing I haven't pointed out in these graphs, but I think you'll recognize, is number three. Each function, f of x equals a to the x, this is where a is different than 1, is a one-to-one -one function. You know, all of the graphs that I've just drawn here pass the horizontal line test. And what that means is that each of these has an inverse function. That's going to become a very fundamental idea in, uh, in the next episode. The fact that these are one-to-one, -one, and therefore they have inverse functions. They're inverse functions we're going to call logarithms. Uh, the reason I excluded the case of a equals 1, if we come back to the green board, let me just show you this situation. Um, if we have f of x equals a to the x, and we know that a is bigger than 1, then I know the graph generally looks like, looks like that. And if we have f of x equals a to the x, now, we said we're always choosing a to be bigger than 0. If it's less than 1, then the graph generally looks like this. And you know, in both these cases, our graphs pass the horizontal line test. See, if I draw horizontal lines through these things, they, they cross at only one point. Now, of course, if you draw a horizontal line down here, they don't even cross it at all. But to be a one-to-one -one function, 
it says no, uh, that a horizontal line can cross it at most one time. But look at the one exception to that rule. What if I put in one in the base? You notice one is omitted here and one is omitted up here. What does the graph of one to the x look like? One. Yeah, one to the x is one. One raised to any power is one. Even to the zero power, it's one. And so when I graph that function, if this is one, when I graph that function, it looks like this, f of x equals one to the x. Now, that's not a one-to-one -one function. It's a horizontal line. Um, and so this, that's why I've ruled out the one case where, um, where a, a could be one. OK, let's go to uh, three functions in the next example, in the next graphic. And let's graph each one of these. Uh, on the screen. There's f of x equals 5 to the x. Let me just write that one down here. f of x equals 5 to the x. We've actually drawn that one already, haven't we? Then there's the function uh, g of t equals 1 third to the t. And now here's the ringer m of x equals 0 0.1 to the negative x power. Now that's the one that's truly different from anything we've graphed so far, or at least it looks different. Okay, uh, for 5 to the x, I think I I chose this as an example a while ago, but let's do it one more time. If I want to graph 5 to the x, uh, I'll plot the point 0, 1, 1, 5, and negative 1, 1 fifth. And my graph looks like this. Now, you see how fast that is to be able to draw it that quickly. And if you remember, when I graphed 2 to the x, I made a table over here on the right-hand side. And oh my goodness, that was, that was really tedious. Now things are speeding up with the target points. When I, go, when I go to my second function, I'll have to label this the t-axis. And um, we don't need to mark off too many points for this one, I don't believe. Uh, the target points would be at 0, 1, at 1, 1 third. And at negative 1, 3. And here's the graph of G. That's the graph of G. <coughs> OK, but now we, oh, say, are there any questions on either of those first two? OK, now we come to this last situation. I have 1 tenth to the negative x power. Now that, that negative and the fraction here all make this to be a little bit uh, surreal, I think. So can anyone think of a way to simplify that? 1 over 10. OK, let's, let's call this uh, 1 over 10 to the negative x power. Now, can you think of a way to reduce that further? Becomes 10 to the x. Yeah, the x. you see, this negative says you should invert the base. And so this is going to be 10 to the x power. So this is just another way of saying graph 10 to the x power. Um, OK, so if I graph 10 to the x, I think we can squeeze that one in right here. Uh, let's say this is 1. And for the sake of argument, I'll just jump up here and say this is 10, so I don't try to mark off 10 units in that little space. So I'll go up 1 unit to the point 0, 1. I'll go over to 1, 10. And I'll go back to negative 1, 1 tenth. Wow, it's kind of hard to squeeze that one in there. And my graph turns very quickly and levels off. And we, we graphed uh, 10 to the x a little while ago. But the purpose of this example is to show you that the author, and I guess just as, in just a mysterious way, the, I, I, can, I can hide these functions and make them look different than what they really are. So it's just a matter of us recognizing the functions uh, for what they what they can be simplified to, and then graph them. Let me just take one more example like that, and I'll, I'll write that one on the green screen. Suppose you wanted to graph um, this function. Let's say f of x equals 6 to the negative x power. Now, when you see the 6 there, you say, oh, yes, this graph is going to rise on the right-hand side, but there's a negative in the exponent. If I get rid of the negative, what would the new base be? One sixth. One sixth. So actually, this function is going to be rising on the left. Let's just graph that. Um, here's six. And I'll go up to the point zero, one. And if I go over one, I go up one sixth. And if I go to the left one, I go up six. And this is the graph 
of 6 to the negative x. Yep, that's the graph of the function f. By the way, this function has another name. You could write it in the form exp sub 6 of negative x. Because you see it's a negative x, not an x up there. Another way you could write this function is to call it exp sub 1 sixth of x. So there are lots of ways of naming these functions. Uh, 6 to the negative x, 1 sixth to the x, or using this exp notation. And uh, it may seem funny that a function can have different names, but you have different names, I have different names. Some people call me Dennis, some say, people say Mr. Allison, whatever. So you go by different names and people know who, you, who they're referring to. So functions go by different names and we should recognize them by these, these various uh, monikers. Okay, let's go to the next uh, example of uh, three new functions. <clears throat> uh, let's see, we just did that one. Let's go to the next graphic. Okay, uh, these, are, these are transformations of fundamental um, exponential functions. f of x equals 4 to the x plus 1, and then two others. Let's, let's take f of x equals 4 to the x plus 1 and graph it, and we'll come back to the other two. Uh, okay, so f of x equals 4 to the x plus 1. Uh, by the way, I, I should remind everyone that surely by now you know that all of these examples are worked out on the website. And it, so if you just go to the episode 16 uh, web page, you'll find these examples and the graphs shown. So if you're hurriedly trying to copy down everything I'm writing on the green screen, it's probably hard to keep up with. But you can see this, 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 this written out um, fully uh, on, on the web pages. Okay, um, this is the function 4 to the x with a transformation. Uh, can anyone tell me what the transformation is for this graph? Shifted up one. Shifted up one, right. And that's the only change that's being made. So when I draw the graph, um, I'm going to have to locate a new origin. That's, that's the name we've been giving. Better move y up a little bit higher there. Um, and uh, let's see, you know, we said that the x-axis was a horizontal asymptote. I'm going to move that up one, and I'm going to put that dotted line in right here. And as we've indicated before, the asymptote is not, is not officially part of the graph. It's merely an aid in helping us sketch it. If I don't put that dotted line in there, it's not clear that the graph is supposed to be leveling off. So my new origin is one unit above the original origin. Now, from this point, I go up one. And going back to the new origin, if I go over 1, I go up 4, 1, 2, 3, 4, which actually puts me across from 5. And from the new origin, if I go to the left one, I go up 1 fourth. Because you see, basically I'm plotting 4 to the x. I'm just doing it one unit higher than I did before. And my graph comes down like this. And it approaches this horizontal asymptote. And this is the graph of f. Now, I hope this sounds very familiar. And you're saying, oh, this is just more of the same old thing, because it really is. You see, college algebra focuses primarily on drawing graphs of functions. So it's a very visual sort of, uh, sort of uh, uh, course. Whereas intermediate algebra dealt primarily with algorithms like the quadratic formula, factoring polynomials. So it was a different slant on algebra. And what we're doing here is actually analytic geometry when we're drawing graphs of, graphs of these functions. OK, let's go back to that screen and graph the second function that was listed there. Um, we have g of x equals 0.2 to the x plus 2 power. OK, let's look at the function g of x equals 0.2 to the x plus 2 power. Uh, another way of expressing this is to say this is 1 fifth to the x plus 2 power. And another way of expressing this is to say this is exp, that is the exponential function, base 1 fifth of x plus 2. And the exponent goes inside here. Uh, so all of these are referring to the same function just by, just by different names. Now, when I go to graph this, I'm going, to, uh, be, I'm, I'm going to be making a shift in the function 1 fifth to the x. Uh, which way will I be shifting this function? To the left. To the left two units. So I'll move to the left two units at negative 2. 
this is my new origin, but this is not a point actually on the graph, just where I'll begin to locate the points that are on the graph. Uh, let me just fill in the rest of this axis here. X-axis, Y-axis. So at negative 2, this is the new origin, I go up one point. If I go to the right one, I go up one-fifth, because the base is one-fifth. And if I go to the left one, I go up the reciprocal of one-fifth, so I go up five, and it looks like five is right there. So when I graph this function, it comes down, levels off, and it's indistinguishable from the x-axis at that point. Um, let me ask you some questions about this graph. Are there any x-intercepts? No. There are no x-intercepts because, uh, as we just said, this graph approaches but doesn't cross the x-axis. Looking at it from another point of view, if you're looking for x-intercepts, what you do is let y be 0. And if I put a 0 in there, 0 equals 0 0.2 to the x plus 2 power, this has no solution. Because if you take 0.2 to any power, you will get a positive number. You, you'll never get 0 for the answer. So there's no x-intercepts. Now what about y-intercepts? So x equal to 0. You said x equal to 0. So this time I'm going to substitute in 0 for x, and I get 0 0.2 to the 0 plus 2 power. And that's 0 0.2 squared, which is how much? 1 125th? Uh, uh, let's see, point 0.2, well, 2 times 2 is um, 4. 1 to the 25th. I'm uh, a 1 over 25. Okay, uh, 1 over 25 yeah. is a fraction. Sure. As a decimal, I was going to say it's 0 0.04. And Stephen's giving us the answer as a fraction, 1 over 25. Yeah, that's the same thing. Uh, and so that tells me that we cross the y-axis right here at 4 hundredths. Almost 0, but, but not quite. Okay, let's go to our, our third example <coughs> on that graphic. This is the function y equals negative 2 to the 2x plus 6. Now, this one has a few, uh, a few uh, uh, tripping points in it that we need to investigate. Let's consider c, which is y equals negative 2 to the 2x minus 6 power. Now, let me ask you, does this mean negative 2 to the quantity? 2x minus 6, or does it mean 2 to the 2x minus 6 with a negative outside? Which one of those is this? The second one. It is the second one. And it's merely by agreement in notation as to how this is interpreted. We don't put the negative 2, the negative on the 2. We raise the 2 to the exponent. And when we're finished, we put the negative outside. So this is, this is how we interpret that. But it's only by agreement in mathematics that that decision is made. Okay, now when I graph it, <coughs> the first thing I'll do is factor the 2 out of the, in the exponent. That's 2 to the 2 times x minus 3. Okay, and I, I remember that that negative is outside the parentheses. It's like I have parentheses right here, but if I show them, it makes it kind of awkward to look at. Okay, now the next thing I'll do is I'll take the 2 and separate it from the x plus 3 and write it this way. 2 to the 2 squared to the x minus 3. Now, you might say, wait a minute, is that legal? Well, one of our properties of exponents that we looked at on our very first graphic today was that if you raise a to the m power to the n power, that's a to the m n power. This is the product of the two exponents. So what I've done is to take the product and separate it and put a 2 in and the x minus 3 out. Now, what's the advantage of writing it this way? Matthew. You, well, you can just raise 2 to the second. Okay, which is 4. Uh, 4. So why don't we just call it negative 4 to the x minus 3. So this function has, gone, has undergone some changes, but I think it's easier to graph in this form. So if I want to graph that, what I'll do is make a translation. Uh, which way should I translate this, up or down, or left or right? To the right. To the right, yeah. This says move it to the right. I'm going to move it to the right 3. And uh, this tells, the negative sign tells me the graph is inverted. So rather than going up 1, I'm going to go down 1. 
And if I go to the right one, I should go down how much? Four. Four, yeah. I should go down to negative four. You see, normally if I went over one, I would go up the base, but we've inverted it so I go down the base, so I go down to negative four. And uh, going back to the new origin, if I go to the left one, I should go down the reciprocal of four, or one-fourth. So my graph looks like this. Yep. So we have just graphed the function y equals negative 2 to the 2x minus 6. Although we didn't graph it in that form, we graphed it in the form that we wrote up here. Okay, um, so if you have a coefficient in the exponent, like a 2 in this case, I would say bring that 2 in to the base, change the base, and make the exponent look, look simpler. Let me just work another example like that. Suppose we have um, f of x equals uh, 1 half to the um, 3 minus 3x power. Let's see, there are other ways we could express this. We could say this is the function exp sub 1 half of, of what? What would I put in the parentheses? 3 minus 3x. 3 minus 3x. Yeah, I could write it that way, although it certainly doesn't look any better than it did to begin with. Uh, I think part of the problem is I have a coefficient on, that, on, that, uh, on the x. So let's try going this route. I'm going to factor out the negative 3, factor out a negative 3, and call this x minus 1. I factor out a 3 because 3 is a common factor, and I factor out a negative because I'd like the x to come first rather than second. Now the negative 3 I can bring inside the 1 half, and that's 1 half to the negative 3 power, and then that's raised to the x minus 1 power. Now what's 1 half to the negative 3? Eight. 8. That would be 8, yeah. That's 8 to the x minus 1. Okay, now I think we actually have something we can deal with fairly easily. This is the same thing as what I had over here. So what I've done is I've used properties of exponents to get me from there to 8 to the x minus 1, and now 8 to the x minus 1 I figure I can actually handle. That's not such a complicated graph. Okay, let's graph it right here. Um, I'll set up my axes, and uh, let's see, was there a question? No? Okay. So if I go over 1, uh, that's my new origin, and I should go up 1 to locate a point. So at 1, I go up 1. If I go over another one, I should go up how much? 8. 8. I should go up 8. Well, for the sake of argument, let's say 8 is right there. And if I go back 1, which puts me right at the origin, I should go up how much? 1 8. 1 8th. Right here. And what we have just graphed is the function f of x equals 1 half to the 3 minus 3x power. It looks very ugly that way. But when we say it's the same thing as 8 to the x minus 1, it doesn't look so, so difficult in that format. So we've, we've graphed both these functions at once because they're the same thing. We've graphed 1 half to the 3 minus 3x, and we've also graphed 8 to the x minus 1 power. It's, it's the same function going by different names. Okay, now I'd like for us to look at one special exponential function that has numerous applications in business, in chemistry, in physics, in engineering, and in still other disciplines. And this one is called the natural exponential function. Now, the, the, the base of this function is a special number called e. If we can come back to the green screen for a moment, let me just show the class something here. You know, um, there is a number 1.41428, something like this. Um, and no, nobody remembers those decimals exactly. In fact, I'm not quite sure I have it exact, but the way we write that number is we call it the square root of 2 because this is a symbol for an infinite decimal expansion that uh, we just couldn't write out. It's infinitely long. On the other hand, 1.732 dot dot dot. Does anybody know what that is? That is the square root of 3, or at least it's the first few decimal expressions, de decimal values of the square root of 3. How about this number, 
3.141592, what number is that? Pi. Pi, yeah. <laughs> See, we have a symbol for that number because it's just too difficult to try to express it exactly. In fact, it's impossible to express it exactly because it's infinitely long. We don't have enough time in our lifetimes to write out a number infinitely long. Well, there is another number that you haven't seen before, but you'll see now, is 2.718 dot, 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 dot. This number is called E. Now, the reason you haven't seen it before is because this number is only useful as an exponential number with exponential functions. And now we have arrived at that point. So this is sometimes referred to as the natural exponential number, or I'll just say E for exponential number. Okay, so what you want to remember is the 2.718. Uh, okay, now let's go back to this graphic, and we will look at what's called the natural exponential function. It says the natural exponential function is the function f of x equals e to the x, where e is approximately 2.718. And my, uh, my example here has two parts, and it says sketch the graphs of the following functions. First of all, let's graph the natural exponential function e to the x, and then let's graph the function e to the x minus 1 minus 2. Now, these are as easy to graph as the last ones that we just looked at. Let's take, let's take this first case, f of x equals e to the x. Um, now, you might, you might ask the question, why is it called the natural exponential function? What's natural about 2.718 dot, dot, dot? There's nothing, doesn't seem natural at all. Well, this function arises in a, quote, natural way when you investigate certain applications, applications that we'll be seeing in the next few episodes. So because of its, its sort of a natural uh, representation of certain problems, it's called the natural exponential function. And you might say, Dennis, how natural is it? Well, I tell you what, it's so natural. If you look on the green screen, this, number is some, this function is sometimes abbreviated as exp of x, and there's no subscript. If there's no subscript on the exp function, they mean to use the natural base, and the natural base is base e. Not base 2, not base 5, but base e. So if you wanted, if you wanted for emphasis, you could put a little e down there, but that would be redundant, because if you leave it out, it's assumed to be the natural exponential function. Again, I will not use this notation, this exp notation, on exams or homework, but uh, I'm just letting you know this for applications of this material. Okay, I'd like to graph this function, and we said that e is approximately 2.718. So when I graph this exponential function, I'll graph it just like I've graphed all the others. There are three target points. Um, what will be the first target point? Zero, 0.1. Zero, 0.1, exactly. Nothing's changed. What will be the second target point? 1e. One, 1, and go up e, okay. Well, that's about 2.7. I'll have to kind of approximate that. That's, that's about E, let's say, right about there. And if I go back one, I go up 1 over E. Now, you can try this on your calculator. If you take 1 over E, that's approximately 1 over 2.718, and that's approximately 0 0.36. So let's say it's roughly a third. I'll go up roughly a third, because who's going to be able to tell the difference between 0.36 and 0.33, it's uh, indefinitely. So I locate these three points, and I draw the natural exponential function. Well, it should be approaching the x-axis right there. Okay, now this is the first time we've graphed this function, but it won't be the last. You will see variations of this graph come up um, frequently in the rest of uh, the material for exam three, and you'll see it come up in other courses where college algebra is applied. So when you, when you look at this function, it looks very much like all the other exponential functions that we've been, we've been graphing, um, except it's allowed us to discuss this new number, uh, e. Let's see, there was another function there that uh, we wanted to graph. Um, g of x equals e to the x minus 1 minus 2. Let's graph that one. g to the x equals e to the x minus 1 minus 2. Uh, first of all, can anyone think of a way to write that using the exp notation? exp uh -huh. of x minus 1. Right. Close parentheses, 
Minus two. Minus two. Yeah, it looks kind of weird that way, doesn't it? But uh, believe it or not, that is another representation for this function. Okay, we'd like to graph this. So what I'll do is to make two translations. I'll have to move my, uh, I'll have to move one to the right and two down. So one to the right and two down. Now, when I go two down, I have to take my horizontal asymptote with me. But I didn't move a vertical asymptote over because there was no vertical asymptote. There's only a horizontal asymptote here. My new origin is sitting right here because my origin moved over one and down two. Now, from the new origin, I go up one to locate the first target point. From the new origin, I go over one and I go up E. Let's see, I better fill in a few values there. I go up E, one, two, 2.7. That's actually uh, E minus two on the y-axis. That's E minus two because I started from two below. And if I go to the left one, I go up one over E, which is about 0.36. And now I draw the graph. You see, it's really very fast. And we've now graphed e to the x minus 1 minus 2, or you could say we've graphed the exp function of x minus 1 minus 2. Yeah, that, that's all written on one line there. That's not an exponent. I should maybe move that up a little bit. Yep, okay, that's, that's all there is to that one. Uh, this one is not on the graphic, but let me just ask you how you would, uh, how you would graph this. Suppose you wanted to graph uh, the function f of x equals 2 times e to the 1 minus, let's say, 1 plus x. e to the 1 plus x. Oh, excuse me, let me just change that in one way. I'm going to change that to the negative x. I think that would be more instructive. Um, any suggestions on how we would graph this? We can make the two times one over e to the x. Uh, right, this is uh, two times one over e to the x. What Stephen has done is he's moved, he's moved the negative into the base and he inverted the base, that's fine. So now I have an exponential function with a base smaller than one. So there's, there's no translation, vertical or horizontal, so I start off and I go up, <coughs> well normally I'd go up one, but there's a stretch of two, so I should go up two. I should go up to two, because we've, we've, we've stretched it. And if I go to the right one, I should go up one over e. How much do we say one over e is? About a third. It's about a third, so I'll go up about two thirds, roughly. And if I go to the left one, I should go up E, 2.7, I'll go up 5.4, I'll double E. One, two, three, four, let's see. I'm gonna have to move that out of the way, Stephen, to get your graph in here. Uh, five, 5.4, I'm gonna have to move the whole thing out of the way, sorry about that. Uh, six, five, six, 5.4 is right about there. And my graph looks like this. This is the graph of F of X equals 2e to the negative x power. Okay, in the last few minutes here, uh, I'd like to compare two graphs on a graphing calculator. Okay, for our last graphic, uh, let's look at the battle of the, of the titans, you might say. We want to look at a comparison of the graphs of exponential and polynomial functions. So uh, on this graphic, it says a graphing calculator helps us to demonstrate that polynomial functions climb fast, but nothing like exponential functions and we want to compare the graphs of f of x equals 2 to the x and x cubed. Okay, so if we, if we come to uh, the green screen here, I've gotten this set up so that we're graphing, uh, first of all, 2 to the x, that's uh, the function y1, and then x cubed is the function y2. Now, uh, for example, what if I substitute in x equals 1, how much would be 2 to the x if x is 1? 2. It's 2. And how much would be x cubed when x is 1? One. So it looks like the exponential function is bigger than the cubic function. But if you go to 3, if you plug in 3, 2 to the third power is 8, but 3 cubed is 27. Now the cubic function is bigger than the exponential function. Let's take a look at this graph. I've set up the window. Let me just show you the window size I've chosen here. My x's go from 0 to 5, and my scale is uh, 1 unit on the x-axis. 
and my Y units go from 0 to 10. And just so it's not too cluttered, I made the scaling every 5 units. And when I draw the graph, here's the exponential function. And then here's the cubic function starting underneath, but it crosses it. So it looks like the cubic function passes up the exponential function. In fact, it certainly does. But I think the exponential function is going to crisscross with it, and the exponential function will be on top eventually. Let's zoom out. I'm going to pick a larger window. OK, this time, let's have our x's go from 0 to 10. And I'll, I'll change my x scale so that, let's say, every 5 units, there's a tick mark on the x-axis. And I'll have my y's go from 0 to uh, 200. Uh, in which case, maybe we better have our y scale go every 50 units. And let's draw this graph. OK, so first we see the exponential function, 2 to the x, turning up. And now we see the cubic function. And you see, here's the cubic function on top. It was a graph second, because it was the second one in my list. And they did a little crisscross back here that we just observed. But now it's so compressed, we can't see it anymore. The cubic function is above the exponential. But I think there's going to be another crisscross higher up. Let's go back to the window and raise it. I'm going to have my x's and my y's go up to 1,000. And let's have our y scale be every 250 units. And let's see what happens. Here's the graph. Here's my exponential function. It's rising much slower now because we've, this is 1,000 units high. Look, they're crossing. I think if I go up a little bit higher and go over a little bit wider, we'll actually see the crisscross. So I go to the window one more time. And let's have this go from 0 to, uh, let's say, 15. And let's have this go from 0 to maybe, um, let's say, 1,250. And the graph looks like this. Here's the exponential function. Here comes the cubic function. And they cross. So the exponential function's back on top. They will never cross again. There were, there were two intersections. There was one. Uh, very close to the origin. There's another one further up here, and uh, that's all for today. We'll have to stop.